Last time we talked about, for example, dot product, if you've got a couple of vectors, v and w. The dot product is the product of the lengths times the cosine of the angle in between in the plane of the vectors. That's kind of a geometric representation. Algebraically, to compute dot products, you take the sum of products of corresponding components. Okay, both of these we had on the board yesterday. I'll just use those for reference today. We also had the notion of component of one vector along another. That was kind of quick and dirty. Let's take a look at that. Uh, for example, if this is the vector v and this is w, and they happen to have an acute angle between them, then this length here, be it positive or negative, is the component of v on w. Now, it's not a vector. This is a number. And it's gotten by, as we saw, a dot product representation. The easiest way, I think, to think of it is that it's the vector you're, you're trying to project down dotted with the unit vector in w's direction. So that's a dot product there. There's a, a representation of something you might be interested in in terms of a dot product. Well, why would you be interested in it? Let me try to clue you into that. There's an example in the book. It's a, basically the same one. If one is, has a particle, a little point, a little piece of mass, whatever, and you are applying a force on it, in a given direction through a distance d. Uh, anyone happen to know what the work is, if everything's in the right units? How would you compute work? Moving something, let's say, with a certain constant force through a distance d. Product, Product w work is force <coughs> times distance. If the force is constant, and, well, whatever, the distance is a straight line distance. As long as you're moving along a straight line a certain distance d with a constant force in that direction or opposite direction if it's negative. You're in great shape. Work is force times distance. And maybe you saw that in your high school physics course. Well, what happens if the situation is a little bit different? This is the way you want to move. <coughs> let's say this is your distance d here. And this is the force. Let's make it into a vector. Okay, so. Let's assume like it's gravitational attraction or something, electrostatic attraction. And you're trying to move a particle through such a, a field. How much work is done then? Where the force is still constant, let's say it's a constant vector. And as you move through the field, then it's always acting on it in this fashion. Again, it's that parallel displacement stuff, which is kind of a nice uh, aspect of free vectors. What would be the work in this particular case? I mean, I'm not expecting a gigantic guess. Uh, what you're going to have to do is say, well, really, the only thing that counts is that part of the force, which is the projection of the force onto the line of action. OK. And really, we only need the magnitude of the force, because it's the same thing as over here. You take the amount of force times the distance traveled. So really, I only need this length right here. OK. Well, let's do this. Let's call this P, call this Q. This is where we end up. And now we have a vector, PQ. We have this vector F pointing up this way. And if you think about it, to get our work, we want the length of this shadow of F on PQ. It's exactly what we're talking about over here. It turns out that work will be the force vector dotted with the displacement vector, 
which is a nifty way to do it. One doesn't have to sit there and worry about trigonometry. I, that's what I was expecting someone to say. They would say, well, really, it's this force part here, this component that you need. That would be this length times the cosine of the angle in between, and we need to multiply that times the distance. It turns out that what you just told me, if you uh, rearrange things according to this definition up here, is just the dot product. And that's about as far as it'll go in this course. <coughs> But what happens if you have your particle <coughs> moving around some path in three space with a force that's dependent on time? Not constant anymore, but dependent on time along some curve, let's say C. Starts down here, let's say at time t equals zero, and moves up here until time t equals uh, something, t zero, something like that. Now, when I say this force is a variable with t, that's not just magnitude, that's also direction. Back here, that's the force acting that way at that particular time. So we've got a variable force, we've got a three-dimensional path. It sounds tough. But what you do is what you just did back in the integration techniques on area. Remember we took a famous irregular regions and found their areas by breaking them up into little known parts like rectangles and saying, well, a rectangular area, but anybody can do that. You do that, you sum up those rectangles, take more and more of them as they get finer and finer, and the limit of that sum turns out to be the area that you're after. On the one hand, on the other hand, it turns out to be a definite integral, which if you get your integration techniques together, you can possibly evaluate by the fundamental theorem. Same thing happens over here, as your physics teacher will probably tell you, or Maybe, might be in Calc 3. We'll break this up into little pieces like that, maybe even littler. And if you look at those little pieces, assuming this is a fairly smooth curve, as long as the piece is small enough, it looks pretty close to a straight line. And over that time interval, unless there's a wild fluctuation in the force, it's going to look basically constant. So the work for this particular little line segment will be the dot product of the force nearly constant with the displacement, let's, uh, let's just call it ds, displacement along the curve, which is also nearly constant in terms of lengths. Well, I've, unfortunately, I've got some bad notation there, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, again, a small segment of the path has nearly a constant force, magnitude, and direction, and nearly a linear look to it, although that's a little bit hard to get across. What do we do? We sum up all those little pieces of work from there to there, and the final result, again with a very bad notation, as it turns out, this is delta w, approximately this. The total w will be some definite integral, you know, from somewhere to somewhere. Again, I'm not being too specific because I'm not trying to teach you this stuff. But the eventual result will be in your physics class if a particle moves through a force field um, along a, a certain curve, you will evaluate the work done as a dot product and an integral. And that's where the, the two ideas again come back together. I hope I haven't talked to you out of physics. It's actually fairly easy, but uh, at least if nothing else, I've talked you into the fact that you're going to see dot products, so we better get good at them. If uh, if you want to be able to do this stuff efficiently. So as promised, let's go back and do some problems. These are all on page 643. <clears throat> and we'll start out with a nice easy one, number four. You're given a couple of vectors, A and B. Three-dimensional vectors, I guess we could try to give you a, a rough estimate of where they are, but that's not too easy. There we are in our x, y, z Cartesian coordinate system. The a vector 
comes out one unit in the I direction, two units in the J direction, down three units in the Z direction. <laughs> so our vector is pointing down and out towards us, basically like that. And of course, if you don't see that, I think you're missing a lot of what we've been doing lately. We're breaking our vectors up into pieces, those that go along the x-axis, i, for example, along the y-axis, for example, 2j, and along the z-axis, for example, minus 3k. Those are actually vector paths, if you like, by sufficient stretching and pointing of the basic unit vectors i, j, and k. So there's that one. The other one goes uh, back four units and up one unit. So it's actually in the xz plane, minus 4i and up 1k. Notice there's no j component, so that means we're in the xz plane. Well, there are lots of things we need to do with those kinds of vectors, but uh, just to start out with, all we have are some simple arithmetic things. Don't wish to bore you, but I suppose I should do one of these all the way through. For example, vector addition, what do you do? Just add components. So, Mr. Lauletta, what would we have for that? A plus B. Uh, negative 3i plus 2j plus 2j. Okay, very well. Done. That's uh, just a matter of adding the components for each of the vectors, as we talked about last time. And if I were to try to sketch that thing, which is now impossible the way we've, we've done it here, it says go back three units in the x direction, a positive two units in the y direction, down two units in the k direction. Well, where I'm pointing, supposedly, would be the other vertex of my parallelogram. In other words, this vector addition I'm doing is still the parallelogram law. And that's what's tough. You know, you've got a couple of vectors there. It's kind of hard to climb into that picture, settle yourself into the plane of V, or pardon me, A and B, and actually take a look around and say, okay, over there's the sum, and over here's the difference, and here's the angle in between them, et cetera. You just can't do that. So that's why we need these algebraic <coughs> kinds of uh, methods. Let's see, 5A minus 4B. You're supposed to compute that. What's that going to be? Uh, let's see, Miss Miles. You can give me some intermediate steps if you want to. Okay, take the first component of that, which is 1. So let's say it's 5 times 1 minus 4 times a minus 4, all that times i. So I'm taking 5 times the first component of a minus 4 times the first component of b, slapping that in front of i. Okay, and we just do that all the way down. So the next one would be 5 times 2. I guess I shouldn't be using dots there. It's not really a dot. 5 times 2 minus 4 times 0, j. And lastly, a 5 times a minus 3, a minus 4 times a plus 1, k. So the final result is what? 16 fives, 21i uh, plus 10j minus 15 minus 4 minus 19k. Is that the right arithmetic? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's the algebra. Anybody can do that. What do we do over here? Can anyone give me in words, not, I mean, don't point at anything, but just in words, what have I effectively done when I've computed this entity right here, 5a minus 4b. Extended them in the sense that what, what happened to, uh, let's get the right ones here. This was v, and this was oh, a, I mean. This was b back here, and a up here. So what happened to that vector a? multiplied the magnitude by 5, so it's now 5 times longer. What happened to B? It's 4 times longer and opposite direction, so we've got 5A that way, 
minus 4b this way, if you want to think of it that way. And then we added them, if you want to throw the minus in with the, the, the b factor. So in adding them, I've got a vector that's down here, parallelogram log n. Okay, so every time you do a problem like this, I mean, you can kind of do it with a, a quarter of your consciousness, think about everything else in the world, but maybe use another quarter of your consciousness to try to remember what's going on in terms of the geometry over here. How about a dot b? Mr. White, get your quarter consciousness into this one. a dot b would be negative 3, or is it? No, it would be i times negative 4 plus 2 times 1 plus negative 3 times 1. 2 times what in the middle? Zero, because there was no j component for b, and a minus 3 times 1. So that's, that's relatively painless. Maybe that even takes less than a quarter of your consciousness. And you get a negative 7. Well, what does that mean? What does a negative 7 mean to anybody? Well, that's the dot product, but what's the negative mean? Among other things, can you figure out what that would be? Let's say you didn't have the picture. I just told you the dot product of two vectors is negative. What would that mean in terms of the relationship of the two vectors? They're going the other way more specifically. Well, the angle would be up. Right. I'm asking you a geometrical problem, so I'm, I would look at this thing. The only thing that's going to be negative is the cosine. What's a negative cosine mean? Yeah, that's the idea, that your vectors are point, not pointing together, as I pictured it over here. But it's an obtuse angle, right? It's, it's greater than pi over 2, greater than 90 degrees, uh, which may be interesting information to you. Uh, if this were a, a force problem, that means that the force is pointing in a direction opposite of the <coughs> direction that you're going. It's kind of tugging back on you as you're trying to go forward, let's say. Something of that nature. Okay, let's see. How about the length of 3 times the vector a? Any suggestions what we ought to do first? And there are easy ways to do problems and hard ways. What might you do here? What if you already knew what the length of A was? Multiply. Multiply by 3. Because, again, if you're thinking geometrically, all I'm saying is you expand A by 3, a factor of 3. So obviously, one hopes, and it is true if you think about it, that's 3 times the length of A. And of course, that would be 3 radical sum of squares of components of A we need not compute it out, but uh, it would look like that. So that would be that. Now, the, uh, the next step, I think, was how about the length of <coughs> minus 3a? Is that uh, equal to minus 3 length of a? If you only use a quarter of your consciousness, you might say that's true, because that seems to be what we just did up above. Is that true? should be a resonant no, because no length ought to be negative, right? And if you think about it again, what's this minus 3a in terms of uh, geometry? What's that mean to you? Minus 3a. Change the direction and increased it by a, a factor of 3. Well, we're not interested in direction, so as it turns out, you need to take the absolute value. You can always take absolute values, but in some cases it doesn't make any difference. You should always throw a uh, absolute value around that. And so in this particular case, maybe I have tweaked your, your memory or at least your curiosity. Maybe some of you will go to the book and look at it now. turns out that you'll see in there the length of a constant or scalar times a vector is the length of the scalar times the length of the vector. Of course, this would be the same thing we had before. Any other th interesting things? Yeah, I guess we have a, 
a length of a minus b what would you do with that you think well i was hoping someone would say that but not really because <clears throat> it's wrong it's only going to be true if the vectors are basically parallel and again in terms of geometry let's let's look at it this way here's a okay let's uh, put b somewhere nice let's say here's b and a minus b is that one okay now do you really think that uh, the length of that thing right there is the length of this minus the length of that obviously not especially if b is much bigger but even then uh, if it's smaller you, know, you can't believe it either they'd have to be pointing in the same direction so what you get into and your book has a, a boxed in thing called the triangle inequality it shows you that certain things are not true. For example, the length of A plus B is not equal to, but generally less than, length of A plus length of B. That's a familiar triangle inequality because uh, the sum would be this diagonal. And all we're saying is that the length of one side of a triangle is no bigger than the sums of the lengths of the other two sides. So, that's the famous triangle inequality. Related to it is another inequality, which I guess goes this way in terms of differences. But generally, they're not equal. Those are only going to be very special circumstances where the <coughs> vectors are lined up in some sense. So the recourse is that there is no simple way to do this, as we had over here in the scalar. What you really do is have to evaluate that difference as a <coughs> vector c and then take the length of c. So when you've got sums and differences and you remember the geometry, you, you probably realize that there's no shortcut. Of course, that was kind of true in terms of numbers themselves. Uh, you know, if you took numbers like uh, 7 minus 3, generally it's not, well, that's a bad one, 3 minus 7. Generally, it's not going to be that either. You still have a, a little bit of a problem with a sign. So. There's more to it than that because we also have uh, magnitude, uh, pardon me, direction as well. Okay, next problem. Let's shift over to oh, 15, 16, and 18. Here we're given three vectors. I'll switch to the triple notation. Okay, three vectors. Number 15 says compute 2a plus b dotted with 3c. So it's just like common arithmetic, it turns out. Uh, you're looking at one vector dotted another, that's the, the end operation, the last thing you do, where V itself is a sum of vectors and W involves scalar multiplication. Okay, so just like plain old arithmetic. In fact, as I pointed out last time, this dot is a genuine multiplication type of operation. And in fact, you're going to find that it operates just like multiplication in arithmetic as well. So I guess I'm bouncing back and forth between a couple ideas. There are shortcuts for this kind of an operation. That is, if this were just plain arithmetic, I would think a lot of you would say, well, let's make that 6a dot c plus 3b dot c. And that will be a valid operation. It's kind of a distributive law uh, for the dot product. 
Now we've computed dot products. I'll, well, I'll leave it at that point. Anybody should be able to plug in the numbers and, and get more numbers out of it. So again, if you're doing dot products, don't forget you're supposed to come up with a number, not a vector. Number 16 says, well, let's take a minus b and dot it with a plus b. And sure, you could find the difference, find the sum, and dot them. Or, again, because it looks a little bit like a, an arithmetic problem, we do lots. You could say, well, it's a dot a minus b dot a plus a dot b, but there's commutativity of the dot product. It goes either way. So because of commutativity, those two are equal. I'll give you the same number. And there's another way to look at this, uh, not that it's necessary, but you could find that a dot a, as we saw yesterday, is just the length of a squared. And the same down there for b. So the final answer is, if you happen to know what the length of a and b each is, is the difference in the squared magnitudes. Well, I'm trying to demonstrate without actually computing anything is that there are ways to simplify or adjust or modify certain expressions and pretty much you're safe just as you were with arithmetic. Okay, the problem we haven't had much to do with is to find, I think this is problem 18, we'll use the same vectors. Let's find the component of C on A. And I think it'd be a good idea if you at least initially, sketch out some kind of representative picture. What we're looking for is that number right there. Just get yourself used to what this component is. It's the component of C on A. Now, that's fine if you know that. The other thing I think you ought to know, as I said before, you should take the dot product of C with A over its length. Just basically memorize that. It's probably the simplest thing to do. And let's see, we can do that one pretty easily. C dot A, let's see, would be 1 times a minus 2 plus a minus 5 times 3 plus 2 times 1 all over length of A square root of <coughs> minus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared. Again, I'll let you compute that out, but that would be that number, that shadow length in this particular case. Well, notice one thing that it's uh, what? Positive or negative? Ms. Miller? Negative. Minus 2, minus 15 on top anyway. Plus 2, you get a minus 15 on top. What's that tell you about the two vectors? It's obtuse again. In fact, in this particular case, apparently, I haven't drawn it as I should have. C actually points in this direction. The angle between them, theta, is bigger than pi over 2. And for that reason, your dot product is going to be negative. Or I should say vice versa, knowing the dot product is negative. I know that that's true up there. So that length I'm looking for is actually a negative number representing a, a different direction. Now, does anyone care to think off the top of their head that if you've got the comp component of C on A, is that the same as the component of A on C? Anybody firmly believe one way or the other? Firmly believe it's not. Firmly believe it's not. I got a couple of no votes. I'm with you. Generally, they will not be the same things. The shadow of one vector on another is not going to be the same as the shadow of the other on the first. We're talking about two different kinds of projections. Basically, you get two different answers. And it's pretty obvious if you looked up here, it's going to be a dot c over the length of c. 
as opposed to the length of A, unless you've got the same lengths, it's not going to be the same. So numerically, you can establish that as well. Okay, problem 32. We won't do it in full glory, but it comes back to a, uh, a notion we dealt with, I think, in section one. And that is they basically give you three points in space. We'll not do anything too specific here. Here's point P, point Q, and point R. They give you the coordinates. And the question is, do you have a right triangle? And if you have a right triangle, compute its area, which is pretty easy to do, knowing what the lengths are. We did talk about that before. Now, what, what did we do last time when I asked you about a right triangle? What did we basically establish? Yeah. We dealt with distances. I looked at x, y, and z, and perhaps we had x squared plus y squared equals z squared, or if that didn't work, x squared plus z squared equals y squared, or, you know, the last case. Well, that's perhaps not the most efficient way to do it. I don't know. I'm not uh, sold on either one, actually. But in terms of vectors, what I'll offer to you is the notion of dot product and the notion of orthogonality. And was it clear to you from last time what the two had to do with one another? How could you show that two vectors were orthogonal or perpendicular? Let's say, is PQ perpendicular to PR? How could I easily establish perpendicularity? dot product is zero. Someone says why? Right. For be perpendicular, you want the angle between them to be pi over 2. The cosine of pi over 2 is zero. And that means these are equivalent. Because again, as we've seen, this is the length of PQ times the length of PR which are non-zero, in this case, times the cosine and the angle in between. So the only way that dot product can be zero is when the cosine is zero is when the angle is pi over two, an equivalent statement. So without you going through it, or at least without us going through it now, I've set you up as to what to do, create all these, well, these three vectors and take them, dot them in pairs. As soon as you have a pair dotting to zero, you've proven that it's a right angle. I don't know which one it is, but let's just say it's this one right here. The unfortunate thing is that you've done all that work with dot products. You have to go back then and take and find lengths again to find the area. One half x times z would work if that happens to be the way it works out. But anyway, dot products is a nice way to establish perpendicularity. Now, problem 38 carries on with that idea. You're given two vectors, let's say a is, uh, let's say V, vector V is 3CI plus J minus 4CK. And another vector W is CI plus 4J plus 2K, where C is some constant. A question will be, in this problem, what C's make V and W perpendicular, or as your book calls it, orthogonal? Same idea. What C's, or maybe more than one, make those two vectors perpendicular? Well, we've just talked about dot product perpendicularity. Obviously, it comes down to taking the dot product and hoping that you can establish what the c's would have to be. Well, 3c squared plus 4 minus 8c. Good old quadratic equation. Again, I'll leave it at this point. I don't want to review all of your high school algebra as well, but that's the basic idea. And assuming the thing has a root or two, you're going to find that there are maybe none, one, or two possibilities. I guess it's zero or two, isn't it? And I think the last problem I wanted to 
check with quickly is uh, a very important one. I'm not just leaving it out as something to fill up the time. What you need in some situations, as we've seen before, is something like the following. Uh, here's a vector A. And now I'm back in two space, so this only has two components. I have a vector A, which is minus 2i minus j. And what I want to find, for example, is a unit vector in the same direction. We've done that many times. You basically take A, divide it by its length. Get the number up here. Uh, length is radical 5. So a unit vector in the same direction would be A over radical 5. That shrinks it down. But the question this time is, find two unit vectors which are perpendicular. Obviously, there are two. Find either one. If you have one, of course, you have the other by just taking its negation. Find a vector which is a unit perpendicular to A. That's something you'll need every so often in your vector analysis. Now, that one may actually take a little bit of work. And uh, let's assume we don't know what's going on too well, which is probably the case. And what I'll say is that we'll let u be represented as a u1, u2 pair, and then establish what u1 and u2 have to satisfy. Uh, for one thing, it's a unit vector. I should have a square root there. Of course, I can square both sides. I'll have the same result. And the other thing is perpendicularity. A and u have to be perpendicular, so 0 would be a dot u. Again, we want to represent perpendicularity by a dot product. And a dot u is minus 2u1 minus 1 times u2. So if you put those two together, what we have is uh, 2u1 plus u2 is 0. And above, squaring up u1 squared plus u2 squared equals 1. I'll let you again solve that algebraically, producing, as it turns out, a pair of u1, u2 values. <coughs> uh, I think the end result, I guess I worked it out, it's kind of pretty, and it's maybe something worth remembering. It turns out u should be represented as plus minus a2 minus plus a1. We're talking about a pair. You take the upper pair and the lower pair, all of that divided by a. It says here, if I did my homework correctly. So the, uh, the result is, if you have a vector a, you can find a unit perpendicular by basically switching the two components, put a minus 1 in front, the minus 2 in back, and then changing the signs, either one way or the other. For example, uh, if we make this a plus a2, I would make this a negative a1 and divide it by the length. I guess that's the, well, that is the length. I guess that's the uh, end of the hour. Next time, we'll pick up uses of vectors on things that are slightly more interesting nice curvy surfaces in three space. See you then.